Cool. Okay. Hey, Brett. <laughs> Hi, Meg. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so great. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to begin by just, you know, pepping you up a little bit, talking about your accomplishments, and then we'll get into more questions based off women in sport. So beginning with the Olympics, um, Britt was in London 2012. That was her first Olympic appearance. Um, she helped the freestyle relay team to fourth place. Um, she was then named the 2012 Canadian Junior Female Swimmer of the Year. Um, and Rio 2016, you won your bronze medal in the freestyle relay, which is awesome. Um, and then other accomplishments, which, which there's a ton of them. Um, Toronto Pan Am Games in 2015, bronze and freestyle relay, fourth 800 meter freestyle. FINA World Championships 2011, junior gold, 400 meter freestyle, gold, 200 meter freestyle, silver, four by 100 meter freestyle, silver and 200 meter freestyle. Um, Pan Pacifics in 2014, you won bronze in 800 meter and 1500 meter freestyle. And you also set the national records for both of them. And then you were named Swimming Canada's Female Athlete of the Year. And for University of Georgia, which I know you're a huge advocate for, we've talked <laughs> a lot about football. <laughs> um, you set the NCAA records winning the 500 yard and 16 or 1,650 yard freestyle events, helping the Lady Bulldogs to their second straight national title. And you earned swimmer of the meet honors at the NCAA, NCAA championships. Now, you're retired. You retired late October 2016. And you still hold the record, the Canadian record for 200 meter, 400 meter, 800 meter, and 1500 meter freestyle events, which is incredible. And I mean, for those of you who don't know Brittany, you're also an incredible person and super humble. I remember, so you and I worked together for the Blue Jays. And I remember during training, uh, you were a team lead and everyone was introducing themselves and Brittany's like, hi, um, I'm Brittany McLean and I used to be a professional swimmer. <laughs> and then you just went away. And then the next day, <laughs> our manager's like, yeah, so Brittany was pretty modest yesterday, but she actually is a bronze Olympic medalist and brought her medal here for us to see. <laughs> I was like, who is this girl? <laughs> <laughs> I like to keep as mysterious as yeah, possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. So congratulations on all your accomplishments. Thank you. That was a beautiful intro. You're I am, welcome. Uh, very honored that you went through all of that. But <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> So talk a little bit about where you're working now. Yeah, so um, I work at the Canadian Olympic Committee now in athlete marketing and Olympian legacy. So it's a long-winded title that uh, I like to break down into the fact that I talk to athletes all day, which is super, super fun. Yeah. Um, so we work with the entire Olympic roster. So everyone that's in winter sports, summer sports. Um, so it's not just swimming I get to work on. It's, it's all over the map, which has been really fun. Um, and we work on pretty much opportunities that come um, outside of what they do in their field of play. So whether that is um, a speaking engagement, an event with one of our Olympic partners, um, something like Pride Parade or our educational, um, we do a program called Classroom Champion. So there's like different things that they can do in their community. And then there's a whole other side of it with our retired database. So anyone in my situation that's not currently active in their sport anymore, so people that are looking to stay involved with the Olympic, Olympic uh, movement in a different capacity. So we kind of keep that motion in, uh, in the rest of the phases of their life. So we kind of connect once a month um, through a newsletter to make sure everyone's aware of the different things we're working on, what is out there, what are the options. Um, we have some great programs too for retiring athletes that are trying to get into the workforce. So I work a lot with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's making sure that the COC corporate is always keeping in mind what this, the athletes uh, need and want and uh, can flourish off of. So 
we're kind of that main voice to the athlete, which I love. And it's been super rewarding for me to see from the behind the scenes of, of we call it the team behind the team. So uh, Team Canada from, from a corporate part. Uh, but it's so, so incredible to see the work that goes in. When you're an athlete, you don't really realize it. You're just going through the motions. And not that athletes by any means are selfish, but you kind of have to think about what you need and what your day-to-day -day looks like. So to be able to see it from this side has been incredible. That's awesome. Now, would you have been um, involved at all with the summer games this year? Yep. So my role is um, not as much like at games, but we have what's called a mission team. So every year there's, uh, we only have about 100 employees at the Canadian Olympic Committee. So it's not like it's a massive group of people. And so we have people that their corporate job lives in the games environment. So they're constantly working on logistics of games, how we're getting athletes there, um, you know, how we're presenting on the international stage. So there's people that their day-to-day -day job is always games related. And then there's a lot of people that work more on, you know, the day-to-day -day operations, um, things like our partnerships team, our marketing team, um, you know, how are we flourishing that Olympic movement into to greater things. And so those people can apply to be on what we call the mission team. So you can have a role at the games that's kind of unrelated to your job, if that makes sense. So you would be volunteering in the village. You would be helping at airport transpo. You would be helping um, in what we call Canada House, which is where like family and friends of all Olympians kind of huddle. So there are some like cross department functions. And so my role at the games, I was not going to be on site at the games, but I was going to be a liaison in Canada. So uh, me and my boss are a team of two, and so she was going to be at Canada House working on the Athlete Lounge. So that is basically where athletes can come, celebrate with their families, uh, yeah. a place for everyone to kind of gather. And so she was going to be working there, and I was going to be the on-site in Canada, uh, more of an events-based thing. So as the games are going on, how are we engaging the community? How are we celebrating athletes? How are we working with our partners um, from an events perspective, from a storytelling perspective, everything like that? Uh, so my role was not in Tokyo, no, but um, as this, you know, announcement of the movement of the games, I think everyone was kind of affected. So we're all yeah. just trying to pick up the pieces and move on to how we can to get the athletes uh, best prepared for next summer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it kind of, you know, it threw a wrench in everybody's plans and something as large as the Olympics I know has, is planned, you know, for four years. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think it was definitely unfortunate for a lot of people who put in that work, but necessary. And I know from hearing, you know, on TV and that from athletes and, and people who would have been participating, they do feel safer, you know, not going. And I mean, I'm sure it'll be bigger and better next year. And yeah, yeah. well, I mean, life's going to look a lot different now. <laughs> For sports and that, um, but transitioning into now, you know, your life after sport, like we've been talking about, what was it for you like to transition from being an athlete to now retirement? Yeah, so I, I went through a lot of like phases I'd consider. Um, by no means was it like a super smooth transition, but I felt like um, I did a lot of work to prepare myself for it and I knew it was going to be a challenge. I don't think any of us expect like I, I competed for you know 15 years and I you know it was my life. It wasn't just a sport. It was yeah. everything I did. It was you know every action I made was kind of come came back to you know how it was going to reflect on my performances and so it wasn't just something I did a couple times an hour a couple hours a day. It was who I was and uh, I think one of the most important reflections I've had is, you know, swimming isn't who I am anymore, but it made me who I am. And I'm, I'm very proud of all of that. And I'm proud of like the, the ups and downs and the strength it gave me and the perspective it gave me and the opportunities it gave me. So I was never one that wanted to kind of leave my sport and completely check out of that part of my life. I, I know for some people it is very important that they need to move on and, and find a different identity, but I think my identity very much still lies in, in swimming, but just sport in general. And that's why I'm in the career path I am. Um, but my decision to retire and like that process for me um, 
started, I guess, at the, the Rio games. And so to give a bit of, you know, background, I was 22 years old and, and some people go, oh my gosh, like you were so young. And I definitely was. Uh, but for my sport, there isn't too many opportunities in terms of like a professional level. Um, it is getting a lot better and there's an improvement and who knows where that'll look, what that'll look like next year and the next couple of years, but they came up with their first like international swimming league this year. And um, there's more opportunities, but it's very, very much like for a very top tier of athlete. And so yeah, I competed for my final year in university at, at Georgia, as you mentioned, and it was, um, you know, my last year of eligibility and it was also the Olympic year. So it was kind of like a chapter was already naturally closing and I, I was timing wise, it was put me in a pretty good spot. And so as I finished my university career, I thought about whether or not that meant that I wanted to go professional. And I reflected on a lot of things. One of them was my mental health and something that I'll talk about day in and day out. And I think is super, super important. And I just realized that, you know, I loved what I did and I loved the sport and I love what it provided me, but I also had to like check in with myself if this was healthy for me to do very much longer and the lifestyle I had to keep up. Like I said, you can't kind of do it half in half out. You have to be fully committed to it. And I was starting to notice that I was, wasn't nearly as happy. I was starting to get way more anxious and and just, I, I did go into a, a pre, I call it my pre-Olympic depression because so many athletes have what you call a post-Olympic depression, but um, I was, I had so much pressure that I put entirely on myself and just that level of excellence that I wanted to achieve was becoming, you know, immeasurable and, and a huge weight on me that I lost the fun of what I was doing. And I just was kind of, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to take on. And I was no longer going to be doing it for the university, for my team. And so it was, it went from being a team sport to having to be individual. And I, I lost that love for, you know, what I represented. Um, so that was one of the reflections I definitely took when deciding. Um, another one was just timing wise. Like I, I knew I wanted to be thinking about what I look, what it looked like as a career beyond um, what I was doing in the pool. And so it was an opportunity for me you know, do I want to go four more years where I was kind of not feeling it anyway? Do I want to, because I said this, like you mentioned, this, this cycle of Olympic sport does go in four year increments. So I knew I wasn't really committed to four more. And I thought, what's another year or two? I thought it would really put me behind in terms of my peers in the working environment if I started a couple of years later. Um, and knowing that I was kind of ready mentally and physically I had a ton of injuries. Um, so it was like, I'd have a really good year and be healthy. And then I'd have a year that absolutely destroyed me. And I'd be hit with, you know, all these reoccurring injuries that kept haunting me. And I was a distance freestyler, as you mentioned, my events, but you know, those was long, long hours of training. So it was a kind of a trickling effect, but everything seemed to line up and that it was the best decision for me to move forward. And like you mentioned, in October, I made the choice to, you know, finally announce it. I did my last race in early August, but I took a couple months to make sure that this was something that I wanted and I did on my own terms. Um, and in doing that, I was able to use a lot of great resources to help me transition now. Um, one of them was making sure I was taking care of my mental health, so going to therapy and, and really ending that chapter on a good note instead of a negative note and making sure I was, you know, moving forward and in the healthiest way possible. And so that is something that was really important for me. Um, another thing is we have a program at the Olympic Committee called uh, My Game Plan. So it is entirely related to helping athletes transition. So I used it to the best of my ability. Um, everything that was offered to them, they have networking sessions, they have counselors that can help you on things like your resume. And for me, it was big. I said, I wanna be in sport, but I didn't know what that looked like. And I didn't know what exactly in sport I wanted to do. I had done a little bit in uh, commentary. So at first I was like, I want to go into media. Um, so I, you know, dabbled in a few different areas that way. I did a program with Sportsnet, which was really awesome. Um, I did some public speaking and then I had worked, like you mentioned, part-time at the Blue Jays. I had done, they have a program with RBC where you're uh, able to kind of work in the corporate environment to see if that's something you enjoy. So I pretty much took advantage of every opportunity that they, they gave us. And you have to obviously like apply for all these things and, and really decide what, what works for you. But having those options um, really, really helped me 
I, I don't know if it was more of like a distraction at first, but it definitely gave me um, a new confidence that I always said I was a very confident swimmer, but I didn't really have any confidence in terms of my ability outside of the pool. So having these experiences to try new opportunities in a working environment definitely helped me kind of gain a little bit of, uh, you know, stand up a little taller when I went into new interviews and, and to be able to like gain an understanding that I was capable of doing things, not just in a couple laps in a pool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I'm sure there's a lot of athletes, well, I'm sure every athlete who has, you know, let the sport that they're passionate about kind of guide their life, right, for a long time. And I mean, if there's any athletes listening to this, I know that they're, it's probably helped them to know that, you know, to explore all your options and, and take advantage of programs like that, um, like the CLC had, because that sounds awesome. And I'm happy that you were able to kind of, you know, get out of maybe a funk that you felt and, and find your passion along the way. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think it's important too, when you talk about like what you're, I, I think when we, a lot of us, when we go to university, like you're making these decisions at like 18 years old, what you want to study and what you totally. want to do. Yeah. And it's like, I can't even decide what I want for breakfast today. So exactly. <laughs> how am I supposed to pick up my whole life? And so for me, um, my mom and dad both work careers where they have the same job for, you know, 30 years and same with my, my sister's a nurse. So her path was, was pretty, you know, streamlined into what she wanted to do. And so I always felt like the oddball. I was like, if I don't know what I want, like it started to weigh on me a lot. And so these like experimental phases really helped me um, narrow more down. I can't say at ever I've felt like I know exactly what I want to be doing. I love my job right now. And I think for where I am, this is exactly what I want to be doing. But I don't think forever, like everyone should always have it figured out. And so yeah. that helped me kind of piece together some of the puzzle. Totally. Um... Now, you kind of touched on it, but what would be your advice to anyone transitioning from being an athlete to now a new job? Um, you know, I can imagine that, you know, athletes would probably feel a little stuck, um, maybe unsure about what jobs are available to them. So maybe if you have any general advice for someone who might be going through the transition that you went through. Yeah, for sure. I think the best advice um, or one of the biggest like triggers for me was like, don't um, automatically assume that it's all going to be a straight line. And I, I think as an athlete, you, sh you kind of already know that because no one's career is, is a really straight path. But I retired as one of the best in the world at what I did. And then I went into a working environment where I was at the very, very bottom. And so many people assume like, oh, you're, you're an Olympian, you have everything at your fingertips. And don't get me wrong, it's definitely, um, the, way I, the way I like to put it is it's, um, it takes me to a door, but it's up to me to open that door. And so I do have some great connections and I do have some people in my corner, but I think it was a very, very big like reality check to know that it's not gonna all come easily and it's absolutely up to you to work for it. Um, but I think that feeling of losing, you know, getting off your high horse in the sense of like, you are starting fresh. So like picture it like you were when you first started your sport or picture it like you were, um, when you, you know, you first went off to university and you were yeah. starting a very new opportunity and, you know, be vulnerable and be, um, a little bit like, I loved being a little naive because it led me to all these new things that I never thought possible and every little stepping stone. Um, for me, it was saying yes to everything. And, and I don't mean like, you know, saying yes to the, like <laughs> diving into a new degree because that's what makes sense. But just like someone, if, if, you know, someone said, I have a, a good person for you to meet for coffee, I'd be like, great, let's go. And, you know, maybe the coffee didn't go that well, or maybe, um, it wasn't exactly what I want to be doing, but I felt, tr I truly believed in each of those steps that I took. And so for a while I was a little bit, you know, hard on myself and figuring like, you know, how do I not have a job yet? Or where, how am I ever going to get a job? Because I had applied for a lot of things. Like it's not, I want people to understand like, yes, okay, I love the job I'm doing, but I spent years applying for jobs similar. And, um, I think it's important to like understand that it's not going to fall at your fingertips and 
all of those part-time jobs and um, internships are absolutely worth it. I think I've learned the most out of the things that provided me zero dollars and I was able to just dive right into and you learn to appreciate, you know, the opportunities after you've gone through something a little bit more challenging. Um, and anyone in the sporting world kind of understands that, you know, most of us aren't doing it for the money if you're in sports. And so it's all about passion. And so for me, it's those two things, like understanding that what you are going through is completely normal um, and finding something that excites you again, because in sport, you have that adrenaline, you have that, that mentality. And maybe your path is totally different than mine and you're looking to get into education or medicine or whatever it is. Um, but being patient with yourself and thinking that it's, it's not going to snap your fingers and come right to you. Um, having conversations with pretty much everyone I could was something that was really important for me. And something that eventually I truly believe led me to my job was being vulnerable enough to say like, I'm looking for a job. Like I'm, yeah. I'm unemployed right now. I'm looking. And so before I was, if someone, if I'd go to a networking event, I would list out like the five or six like part-time things I was working on, which by no means is a bad thing. Um, I think it's awesome to be able to say like, I'm, you know, I'm working on this. I also tend to do this in my spare time. And I was working at the RBC Olympians thing. And so I'd list out all these things. And the day that I finally was strong enough to say to someone in, in a networking environment, like I'm actually looking for opportunities right now. I think was also a gut check with me being able to say like, you know what, it is okay to not have it all figured out. It is okay to not be sitting with a, you know, an income coming in and it's totally natural. I'm a young, I'm a young professional and, and I want to still figure this out. So that was huge. And, you know, a couple months later is when I started this role and it was, it was entirely from having um, a conversation with someone that I connected with and said, you know what, I think you'd be great for this. And this time when I applied for this job, I, um, I was able to connect with a lot more people internally. Um, pretty much anyone I knew that worked at the COC knew that I was applying for it. Um, I asked a lot of people advice. I had a couple of people read over my cover letter. Um, and, and I put more effort into it instead of just like tossing my resume in a pile and saying, you know what, this is it. So, yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, especially when we're talking about women in sport, um, <clears throat> I know from different events that I've gone to or people that I've met to talk about, you know, their advice for women in sport and how we can get more involved and make ourselves more heard. Um, <clears throat> it comes down to what you were talking about of just like, just say what you want, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if it's you, you, you're looking for a job, then you, you stand out more that way too, right? The, they're going to remember Brittany McLean told me she's looking for work mm -hmm. versus Brittany McLean, you know, says she works or does all these six mm -hmm. things. Right. And it's also a matter of that exactly. But too, like knowing I used to get frustrated because I would go for coffee or a network or I do an interview even. And then um, afterwards it's like, well, we think you're great, but we just don't have anything for you right now. And so yeah, I mean, that's like, it's natural because they probably do think you're great and they probably do think you're a good candidate, but there's not always that many jobs out there. So you have to keep battling that like voice in your head that's telling you just, okay, like give up or, you know, get a different job that yeah. you don't really care about. Um, so I kept, kept going until, you know, I always had to believe those people that, you know, you connect in with LinkedIn you connect on LinkedIn with or something. It's like one of those people is going to remember my name one day. And so yeah. I think you just have to continue to have that faith in what you're capable of. For sure. For sure. Um, so you kind of, you already talked about your current role with the COC. Um, as a woman in sport, what would be your advice to give a young woman aspiring to get into the sport industry? So, um, you know, we just talked about networking and not being afraid to put yourself out there and not being afraid to take you know, chances or participate in things that maybe are a volunteer role, um, et cetera. But what would kind of be your main takeaway um, for young women trying to get into the sports industry as a whole? Um, is it networking? Is it refining your resume? Is it having great connections? Is it volunteering? Yeah, I think it's a honestly a great combo of everything. Um, I 
I don't, you know, I think it's entire, you are entirely the product you put forth. And so you may, I, I gained a lot of my confidence through those um, internships and through the part-time work and through my speaking engagements. And so for me, that was something I could stand in front of someone at an interview and say, this is what I can offer. This is what I bring to the table. Yeah. But also understanding that I very much wasn't always, you know, fully qualified for every job that I, that I applied for, but I believed in, you know, like I said, what I was bringing forth. And I was very open to the fact that I still had to learn. So um, I think my advice to women would be um, having your, you know, your mentors and having your people that you can turn to. I've been so lucky and, and I wasn't able to always, you know, see it at the time, but to reflect on every job I've had in sport, whether it's, again, I am a very different breed because I never grew up having a high school job. I never grew up having a college job. So I entered the workforce. The job you saw me doing was one of my very first jobs. So I didn't have this, like, I didn't work, you know, uh, for Tim Hortons in high school. I didn't do babysitting on the side. I didn't have anything that I was doing. Um, so my resume when I graduated university was pretty much only my athletic accomplishments. Yeah. Um, so having to get in somehow was just a starting point and it was great, but I knew, you know, it was up to me then to bring myself up and, um, I'm still bringing myself up and learning every day. Um, you know, I feel like making mistakes is natural. Having growth is natural. Having to, you know, find your way is so, so, you know, just normal. Um, but I have been able to reflect on every job I've had and realize that I had incredibly strong women in all of those roles that were in some sort of leadership position. So being able to see that and be like, wow, you know, there are these women doing some incredible things in sport and it is possible. I think always, I've never gone into a job thinking, you know, because I'm a woman, woman, I'm less than, and I, it's only because of the environments I've been in. Right. So I've been able to see it firsthand. Um, like when, when we were at the Blue Jays, the, almost all of the marketing department was women. Um, then we move up. A lot of our leadership was women. Um, when I was at RBC, I worked for an entirely women-led team. I then, um, I did this pro project at, at Sportsnet. I was on a leadership. Um, it was, it was an amazing thing. We would go through, it basically went through all of the, um, different, in, different departments at Sportsnet. And we did this like project where we had to kind of solve a business case and it was all internal staff. And then I was an athlete that got to join in and there was again like so many women leaders that I was exposed to there, and by no means you know are we more women than men, and I totally get that the sports world is still you know has a masculine tone to it, but I think the the environments that I put myself in were magical because I never saw it any other way, and I never yeah let my mind go that way, and so I think exposing yourself to that and whether that's you know seeing someone at an event or going and, and listening to a conference actually just before this. Um, was listening to a conference where our chief marketing officer at the Canadian Olympic Committee was talking. And um, she is a leader at the COC and she is a female and she is a badass. And so it's, it's so special to see that and know that there is a path for us. And yeah. um, so I think for me, one of those things was just always exposing myself to those opportunities as they are a possibility. Yeah. I love that. And now you mentioned mentor, which was actually my next question. Do you, have you ever had, you know, a specific mentor along your way or has it just kind of always been, um, you know, multiple people that you look up to and would you recommend someone reaching out to someone f to them for them to be your mentor? Cause I know that's something that I, have always kind of had in the back of my mind and, and have been told that, you know, you should really get a mentor and, and that they'll definitely help you with connections. But I haven't really had like one person who I've mm -hmm. felt like I could have a, that, you know, close relationship with, like you've mentioned, I've had a lot of great female leadership around me that I've looked up to. Um, so have you ever had, you know, one or two mentors and and what's your take on someone getting a mentor yeah I think the word mentor to me has to be like organic I don't think I've ever had someone that I'm like I want you you're my mentor like let's go and so um but I do believe in the process of having a mentor and so right now I'm actually 
you know, I talked a little bit about the game plan program um, at the COC. And I promise it's not like a, a plug for the work that I do because it truly is the reason I am where I am today. Yeah. And so now uh, I'm, I'm acting as a mentor for um, a couple of the people that are, you know, a couple years behind where I currently am at or just, you know, in the end of their careers trying to decide what's the next phase. And so that's been really rewarding for me to see, to be able to reflect back on where I was when I was in their position and, and to be able to somewhat a lot of the times it's honestly just like a conversation, like they just need someone to chat with. And I love that because a lot of like so many people out there, we just need, you know, a sounding board and not that I have all this wisdom to provide, but it's just nice to know that I've been in your shoes and I feel for you and I want to help. And the best reflection I've had on sport is realizing that 99.9% .9 of people out there want to help you. And I didn't always get that. I was like, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to bother people, whatever, but I was like, what's the harm in asking? And that's led me to a lot of great places just by saying, Hey, can you help with this? Or, yeah. um, I, I, I just wanted to connect. I wondered if you'd meet me for coffee and you know, what's the worst that can happen. They say, I'm really sorry. I've got a lot on my plate right now, but like, is that, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. So, um, being able to be vulnerable, I've said that a lot, but that really has made me realize that everyone out there really wants to help you and see you succeed mm -hmm. and you know that's the natural tone um but in terms of like specific work uh mentors i haven't had a ton in a work environment i think one of them is definitely that general sense of seeing women in leadership is, is always stuck with me um in life i was always my sister i have an older sister so i always kind of like was inspired by her i was guided by her um, she's now on the front lines as a nurse. And, and so she every day reminds me of, you know, the importance of doing something, um, that's important and something that you care about and something that you feel like you can succeed in. Yeah. Uh, and I know for her, she's in the right place. Um, but another one in terms of my career, and it's not necessarily an organic one, but is my father. Um, so my dad worked for Canada Post as a letter carrier for over 30 years. And it was a job that he took as a, at a very young age to provide for himself and our family. Um, and it was something though, as I was getting older and starting to kind of understand, um, it worked really well for us because he was early mornings to afternoons and they would pick us up from school. He would take us to practice. He would take us to morning practice. Mm -hmm. um, he was always there to drive us wherever we needed to go. And uh, my mom was a teacher, so her hours, um, you know, she couldn't necessarily leave school to pick us up and take us to the pool. and. So to live the lifestyle we lived, it entirely worked for our family. It was consistent and it was what made sense. But I always watched him go into work and I realized when I was older, he, you know, it wasn't something that was enjoyable for him. I would ask him about his day and, and it didn't excite him. And, and that made me really sad when I was older because, you know, I, I saw my dad do a job that he wasn't necessarily like looking forward to going to work. And, yeah. and again, I didn't have that mindset when I was younger, but then when I got older, I realized I'm like, you provided for me, so I had these opportunities and I wanna make the most of them. And so when I think about what the careers I wanted to do and one of the reasons why I was always like so confused as to what I wanted to do is that I wanted so badly because of what he provided me and what my mom also provided me to find something that excited me um, and to find something that I was passionate about. And so I guess that's why I'm so adamant about you know caring for the environment that I work for and finding a job that doesn't, necessarily feel like a job and yes there are some days where it's stressful and yes there are some days where I feel like I didn't do a good enough job but for the most part you know I I'm, I'm looking at my emails or my phone because you know that's what I care about and that's what I'm excited about and like I want to do well for the people that I work for and and in tune for the family that provided me so much so I would say in a weird way my my dad is definitely one of those those you know mentors for me and it wasn't necessarily because of what he did but it's how he went about it and what he maybe missed out on that I wanted to make sure that he provided for me. So I want to make sure that I'm able to achieve what I know I'm capable of. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so sweet. And, um, you know, it's great. It's great to have the outlook where you can look to the people who are close to you to be your mentors, right? It's, and that's good advice where it doesn't always have to be something that you're searching for, you know, on LinkedIn or, or whatever. It, it can be the people right around you that maybe you haven't really 
looked at that perspective before, but mm -hmm. it could be something as simple as that, that drives you, you know, and, and all of a sudden you have this new passion or this new motivation um, to be, you know, the best that you can be. Um, that's awesome. Um, so how do you think that women in sport can make themselves be seen, heard, and recognized? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. I think kind of like I've touched on a lot of it, but uh, I think you have to go in with the mentality that like we are no different and yeah. that we are just as capable and just as passionate and just as hardworking as anyone that is um, not female. And so I've, I've been lucky through sport. I think like it comes back to the fact that maybe it's a naive piece to me, but I did a sport um, in college and growing up, but especially in college, like we had a men's team and a women's team. And, you know, certain sports, there's Title IX in the U.S., there's a ton of different, you know, rules behind women's sports. But my, my narrow path was always men and women. And there was always, we had a, we had a men's coach and a women's coach. And, yeah. you know, I was coached by men most of my life, but I always saw the presence of females on the pool deck. And I knew it was something that was existing and, and could probably grow. Um, but, yeah, so my understanding of it is probably, like, a little skewed just because, I always felt like an equal and the really cool part when I went to university is, you know, we have like a little internal battle is the women's team or the men's team going to rank higher and, you know, <laughs> we could have fun with it and feel powerful because four out of the four years I was there, we did beat the boys. And so <laughs> we, uh, in my head, that was always something that, you know, was a possibility. So, um, how do we keep growing women in sport? Um, walk into that room, say, say those things you want to say um start somewhere i think everyone is kind of anxious to um let their mind overpower the fact that it is possible or you go into you know i love hockey and i love football and those are very you know male dominated sports but you know walk into that interview and for that football team and feel like you can achieve it and That'll take a lot of practice. I'm not saying you're just going to automatically snap your fingers and be like, I'm there. Um, <laughs> I, I spoke about it with confidence, but it was something I really needed to work on when I first started interviewing for places because I thought I was a confident person, but I was confident in something that I knew I trained really hard for. And so in swimming, I trained really hard for this one thing. And I was confident in it because of the training I put in and the hours and the practice and the experience. Yeah. Then I was joining this new thing and this, this trying to get into the workforce. and the one thing I pulled from my confidence in swimming was knowing that I had done the work, but I stood here knowing that I hadn't yet done the work. So I couldn't just naturally snap my fingers and be confident in what I was doing because I hadn't put in the work yet. So totally. um, walking through that door, starting somewhere, um, but always, always believing that those conversations are important. Um, whether it's, you know, you and I chatting about this, whoever's listening to this, or it's, um, you know, talking to someone that you see in a job that you might want to have one day. Or, you know, it's a family friend that works in, in business and you ask them a little bit about their path. And one of the fascinating things I've learned in, in everyone that I've seen in the sports industry, no one's path is the same. And no one's path makes probably sense to them. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people that, you know, maybe their degree wasn't in sport management like a lot. This, this wasn't a degree you could get. 20, 30 years ago, right? So right, yeah. um, the fact that this is possible, we have sport media departments, we have sport marketing, we have sport management, I'm a sport management grad, but that's now an opportunity, like that's exciting. And that's something that is already a, a growth. And it's not that when you apply for that job or that major, you're, you were less than to get into the department. So I think if anything, I've seen so many powerful women and, and in my head, they continue to grow and do those things. But it's having that mentality that you have to start somewhere, um, having the mentality that we have to believe that we're just as good or if not better. I love it. I love it. Totally. And I mean, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, not having that necessarily negative experience with mm -hmm. men and women in sport. I mean, that's amazing if you haven't had that experience. Right. And, and, part of the reason why I wanted to do this blog was 
I wanted to keep it a positive space, you know, to celebrate the successes of women in sport because sure it is important to have those conversations of maybe where we're not represented or, you know, where the sports industry can do better with representing women. But I think it's also more important to talk about where we are, you know, strong and that there are a lot of badass women and you know there are a lot of jobs in the sport industry that we don't even think about that mm -hmm. women are taking over and you know working at jay's with you i i saw so many jobs that i didn't even know were a job and they were taken up by women so um yeah i totally agree with you and i think that's great advice and just being confident in what you want to do and, you know, recognizing where there are positives and recognizing where there are negatives, but celebrating more the positives, right? And just continuing to acknowledge that there is growth. Um, yeah, and I think like a lot of people watch, watch me or they hear me speak and I'm very outgoing and I'm the first to say that, right? And that doesn't necessarily, that's not everyone. And I don't mean like, you know, put yourself through a door and like, you have to speak eloquently and you've got to be out there. And that's not natural for everyone. And that's totally okay. But like, we all have our own way of finding that confidence within ourselves. Sure. Right? And, and you can't do really, I don't believe any job unless you have some sort of belief in yourself into the work you're doing. So, you know, my first day at the J's, I, it was my first ever job. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. But that like understanding that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm willing to work at, to figure out what I need to do. Yeah. And um, day by day, I gained a little bit more confidence. I gained a little bit more of an understanding of what I was there to do. And then by the next year, I like you, we got, I was team lead. So you have a bit of a leadership role. And now it's like, okay, I'm stepping up to this role. How do I do better than the day I was before? And for me, sometimes it's just about being a little bit better than the day I was before. And sometimes that's, you know, having a conversation. What I've learned through leadership is, you know, we're all kind of very different leaders and that is totally understandable. Um, I was a, like I said, I like to be, you know, loud and, and exciting and I like to cheer and, and in a swimming perspective, I was, my last year of university, we had three seniors. So there was only three girls on our senior class. So we were all named to, as team captains, we were never really named, but we were the, the, on paper leaders of that team. And that year I learned more about leadership than I think I've ever learned. And it was the understanding we were three totally different individuals. Um, we had uh, one girl that was definitely on the, the quieter end, but she was very like in tune with herself and she, she knew what she needed and she knew what she wanted. And I was just like, maybe less in tune with myself, but I was always out there willing to say everything, wanting to be your friend, wanting to talk. And then we had one that was kind of like our moderator in the middle that um, she just, we, we all had just such different personality traits. And yeah. I think if I had done that five, six years before, I would have thought there's no way we can all like achieve something as one. There's, we were also, you know, 20 year old women and, you know, there's a lot of like he said, she said, and, you know, cliques in a group, but, but we put everything aside and decided we want to lead this team better than it's ever been led before. And um, we had an immense group of, of girls, but to put it in a bit of perspective, we were supposed to come 10th to 12th in the nation that year. We were ranked to come about 10th, uh, 10th or 11th. And we met at the beginning of August and, and said, well, what's one thing we can do? And what, what's one thing we can all do? And we said, let's try to be a bit better than we were the day before. And in swimming, it was just, you know, one inch harder or, um, today if I was, you know, really really struggling in practice. Um, how could I pick someone else up or how can I, you know, if it wasn't, if I wasn't getting the speed I wanted, let's work on my technique. Like, let's just find something to be a little bit better. Um, and then we got to our championship season at the end of the year and we were the most unified team I've ever seen. And it wasn't about, you know, who we were as people. It wasn't about what we, what we thought that day or where our mind was. It was that we wanted to represent this, this sense of something greater than ourselves. And we believed in the product we were putting forth. And for us, you know, that, that, that method to get there, I remembered, you know, there was one practice where it really stood out to me because my sense of leadership, um, I wanted to, you know, cheer everyone on. 
but I soon realized that like not everyone re responded well to that. So then there would be certain people I knew. I'm like, okay, you need a bit of a pump up in the middle of practice. And then there was another teammate where I'd see her a little bit upset in the locker room and I'd say, you know what, let's go to coffee and let's chat. And so for her, the best way for me to get through was to have like a private conversation. Um, for someone else, maybe it was, you know, meeting up on, on a morning between classes and walking to class together. And so everyone I figured I could be, you know, the person they needed me to be. And I wasn't changing who I was. I was just adjusting the method I went about it. And so by the end of the season, we were all with that mentality of like coming together as one. Um, and without going into huge detail, we came from nowhere and won the whole meet. Um, <laughs> and it was the most powerful sporting moment in my life because it, Jesus. it was, you know, your typical, you know, miracle moment where like on paper, it wasn't supposed to be ours and we fought back and then we, we achieved something that no one ever thought possible. So that taught me so much about even in the workforce now, like maybe I'll be, you know, cause feeling a little bit of friction between a colleague or, or seeing it within others. And I take a step back instead of my immediate action to want to like defend myself or, you know, fight back or whatever that is and think about what I thought that year and, and harness that energy and think, no, we don't all need the same thing. Yeah. We all need a little bit something different, but it can get us to the same place. Totally. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and how awesome to be a part of that you know, story and success story. And I'm sure that that's always something that you will, you know, never forget and have that sure. kind of play by play. And um, I mean, and it's a great testament to your leadership too. And I know that I felt that at the J's too, you're always someone who would pick someone up or, or notice if there was something a little off. And so, yeah, that's awesome. I'm sure your teammates really appreciated that. And like you said, it's the fact that you can recognize too, you know, there are different styles of leadership. Not everybody is a shark, you mm -hmm. know, where they can just kind of give your idea and that's the idea and you go with it and you win. You know, everybody has their own style and, and we have to all look out for each other and pick each other up and notice where we need help and ask for help if we need it. And yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Meg. No, it's so true. It's so true. Um, okay, so before I get to our last question, um, we'll slip in a couple fun questions here. Mm -hmm. So what, <laughs> what is the most spontaneous thing Oof. that you've ever done? Spontaneous? Okay, well, I love like... Actually, hard because I consider myself. I feel like, like you. I feel like you have done a lot of spontaneous stuff that you probably just don't even. Realize. I don't realize. Yeah, like because you're very. I, I I would say that you are a very like, you know, let's go. Type yeah, of I'm always like, yes, let's do it. Yeah, but I also do love a good amount of planning. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like as an athlete, my life was like very structured, so there wasn't a ton of spontaneity to a certain extent. Yeah. But then I remember when I was retired, um, like as soon as I retired that first summer, I think it leads to just like, yeah, saying, saying yes to random things. Like my first ever job doing commentary, um, I was just kind of like asked because we had an event in Canada and they were like, we need a Canadian athlete. That's great. And then going there and trying to like impress them and then moving on. And then the next summer I was at world championships and um, we then jumped from there. I was like, family we're doing a Europe trip and we did a big Europe trip together and that was super fun um but that was more like one thing leading to another but I thought about this and travel and I was like what's something so many people say like what's the most spontaneous thing you've done and you're like go to the airport without a ticket and like hop on a plane and I've never done that yeah um but I have I was looking at how to do uh, a week I had a long I had a long weekend off work sometime in December a couple of years ago and I have a, a great group of friends in the U.S. all over the place. And I was like, let's, um, uh, I wanted to do a long weekend somewhere. I'm like, where can I go for a long weekend? And a friend of mine and I, we were looking at where we wanted to go. And we went to Iceland for a weekend. <laughs> and yeah. we could have gone anywhere in the U.S. just because we were like, it's a long weekend. Like, how are we not thinking of an elaborate trip? <laughs> <laughs> but we found we found cheap flights and so it was a place it was a place we both wanted to go and it wasn't like super last minute but maybe like a month before we booked it 
and did three days in Iceland. And if anyone's trying to go to Iceland, I have a great three day, I have a great three day tour guide. Itinerary, yeah. Yeah, because I used to always like want to go on a trip and just like let it explore. But with that one, since it was so short, I was like, I have to know what I want to hit every day or else I'm not going to get in what I want to get in. So that was one of the just like spur of the moment kind of things. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's, that's definitely spontaneous. I mean, a month. I a think month. though, like spontaneous to me, yeah, is just like showing up at the airport and not knowing. Like, yeah, I mean, planned no it. one lives <laughs> in a movie. Like, I know it. Yeah. I've been asked that's before, true. I've been asked that before too. And then you end up thinking that you're so boring because it's Do like. Do you know what your most spontaneous thing is? Like, I don't know if I could. I don't know. I feel like I, I've definitely never done anything as far as traveling, um, that's like spontaneous. Um, maybe last summer it was like, it was after a J shift and a couple of us, um, I can tell you who after, cause you'll know them. Um, <laughs> we just went and we started walking downtown, um, like to the lake. I think it was after we had like a social gathering and we didn't want to go home. And it was like almost blackout, like pitch black. I think it was like 10.30 at night, 9.30. And we started walking down to the lake. And then there was this like tiki taxi that would take you from... To the island? Yeah, to the island. And we were, they were like, oh, like, let's do it. And I was like, okay. And it was this guy, I think his name was Mark. He's like this big guy, like gray hair. He's got like this massive, you know, Hawaiian shirt on. And um, Tiki Taxi. Yeah. Have you ever taken one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm just doing my last trip because there was a family on the, on the boat already. <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay. And he's like, but just come on, just come on. Like you can pay me after, like, don't worry about it. And we're like, okay. And um, he's like, you know, like, I'm not actually going to the island. I'm just going kind of for a cruise. And we're like, that's exactly what, what we, we want. want. Don't leave me on the island overnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he drove us basically to the island and then just stopped. And we were all just like sitting there and like laying on this like tiki tacky taxi bench, just like looking at the skyline. And it was oh like, gosh, I love this. so amazing. It was so warm and we took photos and, and Aww. then we went back and then we just kept walking. We got beaver tails and we were just like <laughs> walking along the lake for like three hours and talking. And that was definitely probably one of the most spontaneous things I've ever done because I'm a huge planner. Planner. Yeah. And, um, but it was just one of those nights where I had nothing to do. And I'm just like, why? What That's the best that? feeling too. When there's yeah. definitely those times where you're in a social gathering and you're like, I could kind of go home right now and go to bed. And then there's those moments where you're just like, no, like I'm ready. Like, let's go yeah. have some fun. Yeah. And that's what's so cool about the city in the summer too. Like Tr Toronto yeah. is outrageous and I love it. I was yeah. just thinking though, I have one more quick one. Okay. When I went to get, so there's a big, like, um, it's a, uh, kind of a tradition if you are interested to get the Olympic rings tattooed oh, yeah. and um, once you make your, your Olympic debut and yeah. I I went with my sister because of my first Olympic games I got to go with my sister which was super special um, and so on the way home I was starting my freshman year of university and so I was already like three weeks late to school because I stayed at the games until closing ceremonies so I had like a 48 hour period where I flew back from London and I had to like pack up my whole life basically and start this new <laughs> life in this place I had only been once and it was this yeah. whole overwhelming thing. But we had this like one little period to get our tattoos together and we're like, we're doing it. And on the drive to the tattoo parlor, I still wasn't very sure of where I wanted to get my tattoo. <laughs> so maybe that's somewhat spontaneous because I wasn't really sure and I just got it. And I, I am glad that I did, but it was very much a spur of the moment. I would, I would say that that's spontaneous because that's a lifelong um, yeah. decision. That Don't you, do it. Don't do it, guys. Don't get that. Dude. No, I'm kidding. I, I'm glad with mine, but. <laughs> that's like something I would do with like ice cream or something. I'm like, that's <laughs> what I would order. Like, I'll, you just know. I'll know when I get to the window. Like, then I'll yeah. just say. But I'm still like that with ice cream too. I can never decide. <laughs> I'm like, I want everything. If you know me, you know how much I like ice cream. <laughs> For restaurants too, I'm 
I'm like, I don't know, just like come to me last. <laughs> oh, it's the worst. And whatever I'm feeling, I'll just say aloud. What did everyone else say? Go. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so because we both worked in baseball, mm -hmm. what would be your walk-up song? Oh. Or, you know, I'll give you two if you can't decide. On okay. Um, oh, boy. That's actually so hard. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, I'm one of those music listeners, and same with movie watchers. Like, I will watch anything once, and I will listen to anything and, like, give it a shot. Like, I'm the worst in terms of, like, being super individual with my taste. So, like, you were talking about at a restaurant, like, I can't decide what I like or what I don't. I used to say anything except for country music, and then I went to school in the South, and I now yeah. love country music. I was going to say, why so, do you love country music? I do, I do. <laughs> Honestly, what would make me happiest is probably like a Thomas Rhett song, and I would be in my moment, but it's not very pump up. So I would probably have to also say... You're like, die a happy man. Yes, <laughs> blast me, die a happy man up to the plate, and I will be so happy. But I also understand that it wouldn't really <laughs> pump up anyone else. There's no. also a line about there in about his mansion in Georgia, and that's when we yell, "Go dogs!" Oh. So that's <laughs> me and my teammate are obsessed with that one. Um, but honestly, anything with a beat that I, I am obsessed with lyrics. Like I will sing, I'll hear a song once, and I'll know its lyrics. So <laughs> if it's something I could sing along to, I'm the worst singer. But it would probably be any like mainstream tune right now that's blasting, um, I'd be, I'd be down for it. I just have to make sure I know the words so I can strum my stuff. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And coming back to Georgia, I feel like also something spontaneous you did was when you bought the tickets to go to the national, like the championship. <laughs> that, that <laughs> my friend is definitely the most spontaneous. You are so right. You are so right. Wow. I remember you yeah. Like, I just dropped like two thousand dollars on no, it. No, no, not that much, but almost. Don't 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 share that story. My parents don't like me telling that one. But I <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm very proud of it. It was a lot of money. I won't say the exact number of dollars that it cost, but I am obsessed with Georgia football and they made the national championship and it had been decades since they had made it. And I had just graduated, so I was like, I know all these players. It was so exciting to me game was in Georgia and so I booked my ticket to fly out there as soon as they qualified but then I thought I was like okay there's no way I'm going to the actual game I was trying all my little like ins to try to find tickets I was like there's no way I'm going to the game I just wanted to be there so I flew to Georgia I was there with some teammates I was a part of it I tailgated I did a whole thing and then I decided I was like I've made it here I can't not go in the stadium like I can't I physically no. can't it's like going and to Lululemon just to look yeah, no, there's no way. So I thought about it and I thought long and hard. And again, people thought I was crazy for, for spending that much, but I thought about it and I'm such a frugal person. Like I don't spend money on anything, but if it's a once in a lifetime thing, I'm like, I don't care what it takes. I'm doing it. So for me, that was my, I'm doing it. And probably like an hour before the game started, I got my ticket. I ran to the stadium and I sat by myself and luckily my teammate, well, I, I, no one else was going to be doing it. So I had a couple of teammates that were inside or bought tickets earlier. So out of the spur of the moment, one of my teammates, one of my roommates, like best friends, and her dad had tickets that were in the same row as I was. No so way. All we had to do was move like two people down. Yeah, and yeah, I got yeah. to see them. So it was perfect. And it was worth it, even though we lost in overtime and I don't really want to talk about it. But yeah, anyways. it was so <laughs> worth it. It was the best sporting experience ever. Yeah, you know what, then that's great. But yeah, that's, now you know, now you know what your most spontaneous thing is. If, if there you go. Thank you so much for that reminder. Wow, I am spontaneous. Who knew? <laughs> oh my God. I remember, I think you were talking about it at a shift, like the fact that you're going to go, like, not to the game, but like, you're just yeah. going to go and then, oh yeah. It was right before, it would have been right before a winter fest. So that's probably, it was a January <laughs> thing, so that's amazing. All of my Winterfest dollars went to one football game, but it was absolutely worth it. <laughs> I have no regrets. Hey, you know what? 
it's a memory something to not let everyone know mm -hmm. um okay so final question to end on an inspiring note for yourself um and everyone um name one short-term goal that you have and one long-term goal you have for yourself right now mm. Well, I think short term, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's tough because I am like very much. It's that was this athlete, so I had to set goals. But I'm also like super into being in the present moment and like being excited about where it's going. So I think short term, I definitely want to grow at the Canadian Olympic Committee. Um, I love what I do, and I love seeing like i said that impact that the work that goes in to be able to put athletes in the position that they're all in and i think it's glorified when you see you know the olympic stage but to now see every single day what that work looks like has been super really and yeah. i am it's i'm just so in awe of our leadership i've been in especially through this covid situation um you know from the very top to from our ceo david shoemaker all the way to you know my managers and, and everything we're just so treated like equals. And I don't think I've like really experienced that, that power, that powerfully anywhere. Um, so I want to be able to grow awesome. here and, and I want to be able to, um, see, you know, the work that everyone's putting into it. I want to be able to see it through and I would love to be able, I think short term, one of my things is to be able to go to a games from the other side of it is, um, is really special for me. And I want to be able to, see athletes thrive in that environment and to know that you know some of the work that i put in helped them be in a better position than they were beforehand and and be able to support them in a different way and um you know i want to be on my hands and knees scraping garbage off the floors and you know <laughs> doing the, the hard stuff that people did for me back in the day so it's a mix between like wanting to see it selfishly from the other side but also wanting to give back to something that was like very much um provided for me so um, definitely short term would be growing at the COC and continuing to learn every day. I'm almost at one year there and um, nice. I still Congrats. every day looks, thanks. Every day looks a little different than the day before. So that's something I really appreciate. Um, and I think long term, uh, it's hard. I think I have to continuously um, remind myself to do, to be excited about the work that I do. And so I think I will be successful in 10, 20 years if, if I am. I don't think it's always going to be, you know, every day you're excited to go into an office, but um, that's something that I've kind of devoted to making sure that I check in with myself that like, is this something I really enjoy? Yeah. And um, because I think there's way too many opportunities out there to do something that you don't like to do. And um, so long-term, whether that is like, I don't know if I'll go back to school, that's maybe a possibility. I don't know if I'll maybe, you know, I moved for this job. Um, so I, I live in Montreal right now. And so that was a big risk for me to take, but long-term I would love to be in Toronto. Um, I love, I'm a super family oriented person and I'll never shy away from that. So, um, I would love to be, you know, living in the city and, and being close to my family and doing what I love. Um, and so I, I know that doesn't really answer your question in terms of like specific goals, but, um, I've never really had uh, a path that I've, you know, felt the calling to, but I think the thing I always come back to is like, the reason I work in sport is because I'm so passionate about it and it excites me. And so I want to continue right. to be able to do that and, and impacting others is really big for me too. Um, I work a lot in like mentorship from a swimming perspective and um, it's really, really important to me to give back. So um, that's something that I never want to give up doing amazing that's awesome well Brittany, you're amazing i love you thank you so much for chatting it was so nice to catch up we haven't i know i missed you thank you so much for having me i'm so proud of you for for starting this new project and i can't wait to see it grow thank you i really appreciate it well stay safe and healthy and sane and um we'll talk soon thanks again Okay, Thanks bye. <laughs>